This is Kentucky Afield Radio. This is Ron Rohde, Kentucky Afield's first host back in 1953. Now, I'm proud to present Charlie Bagley. Do you like to get outdoors? Of course you do. And we've grown up with dealing with the mishaps that can happen when we go outdoors. Bee stings, mosquito bites, poison ivy. We go inside outdoors today with the Kentucky Wildlife Veterinarian for a few tips on what to avoid and how to treat. And on a more serious note, we get updates on grave diseases threatening some wildlife in our state. I'm glad you're here. The doctor will see you now on Kentucky Afield Radio. I am a college student. My future is bright. I know soon it will be my turn to take care of the planet. But today I can continue to buy a Kentucky Nature license plate. The plates that say nature's finest. Since high school, they've saved miles of clean flowing streams, forests, and in my lifetime, over 77,000 acres across our state. I can't wait to see what's down the road. See you with me. Next time you renew, choose the nature plate. Plates that keep the bluegrass green. A canoe can take you places barely found on a map, but there's a but coming. Canoes account for nearly twice the boating deaths as personal watercraft. A fact, nearly two to one. Not that you shouldn't canoe, but this might, might, give you twice the reason to wear a life jacket, as if one isn't enough. So if you take your solitude seriously, take this advice. Your life jacket's got your back. A reminder from your Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife. Welcome to Kentucky Afield Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. So, how are you doing today? Take that literally. How is your health? How are you feeling? Is there pep in your step? Good color in your skin? We've heard it said before that health is the great equalizer. You could have a million bucks and stricken with disease, or poor, but in good health. Which would you pick? What about the health of wildlife? wild animals. Just because you don't hear about it doesn't mean it's not a problem, and today you're going to hear about it. Wildlife in Kentucky is generally in good health, but in too many cases it does deserve a get well card. Today we're going to take a look at big disease that affects the smallest amphibians, that affects deer, that affects people. After all, we're all in this great world together. My guest today is wildlife veterinarian Dr. Iga Stasiak. And madam, you look lovely and welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me. We hear things about wildlife and disease in the news. Start first talking about Zika. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, So Zika virus is really big in the news right now, and it's a, a really big public health concern globally, particularly in South Central. America, in Brazil, you've, you've heard about it in yeah, the news. Yeah, like 14,000 cases now. It's a big concern for travelers, you know, traveling to those countries, um, particularly pregnant women, so yeah. um, you know, they're, they're highly susceptible and does cause birth deformities and other complications. We've definitely been working really closely with the public health department here uh, mainly to raise awareness about Zika virus and ways that the public can protect themselves, and just some simple things you can do so that you can still go out and enjoy the outdoors and all the recreational opportunities we have here in Kentucky. Things like wearing mosquito repellent, long sleeves, long wearing, pants. I see you're wearing long sleeves this morning. Is that an indication <laughs> that you're worried about Zika? No, Sunburn? no. I think that's more of a la- laundry issue. Okay. But um, <laughs> Zika, you're a wildlife veterinarian. Is this more of a concern for a vet or is it more concern for someone, say, in family practice, a medical doctor? So as a veterinarian, I deal with all kinds of different uh, disease issues, and a lot of them have that intersection between public health, wildlife, animal health. They're all interconnected. And so when we talk about Zika virus, we talk about um, a disease that's transmitted by mosquitoes, mosquitoes which are, of course, animals. (laughs) So we've got, Mm -hmm. you know, wildlife vector. And a lot of mosquito-borne diseases, not particularly Zika virus, are also uh, transmissible to animals as well. And so we work closely with the public health sector, the Department of Agriculture, and so it is a public health issue. Zika virus isn't impacting our native wildlife. But because we're dealing with mosquitoes, we are involved in, in that aspect of it. This reminds me of a story I heard some years ago about the Africanized killer bee. And they said, well, it's in where? South America. Let's, mm-hmm. let's just say Brazil, that part of the world. 
but it's making its way north. And if it's hot, yeah. say Arizona, you could have the Africanized killer bee there. But Kentucky would be too far north for it to thrive. Is the Zika virus anything close to that? Do they follow that same pattern? Yes. So the mosquito vectors that carry Zika virus, they're invasive mosquito species that were introduced from tropical regions of the world, so uh, Africa and Asia. Um, and these mosquitoes are expanding their range as are a number of tick and mosquito vectors. And that is closely related or linked to uh, climate change and, and changing weather patterns. A lot of these mosquitoes or insects are able to overwinter, whereas in the past they wouldn't have been able to overwinter in these climates. So yes, that is a big concern uh, for us, um, for myself as a wildlife veterinarian, and, and that is the expansion of these vectors borne diseases and vectors moving northward. We're also seeing expansion of, of hosts, so wildlife also expanding their range um, into northern parts, you know, of Canada, species that don't normally, uh, we don't normally find in those areas as well. So, so we're seeing movement of pathogens with their hosts, movement of pathogens with their vectors, um, and so, so we'll probably be busy for, <laughs> for the next uh, foreseeable future trying to, trying to work with these diseases. I remember a disease that was wildlife related called bird flu. Yes. And it seemed to have fallen out of the headlines. Do you follow that being a veterinarian? I have. Is it still an issue? It still is, uh, and I've been following it very closely. In fact, last year we had a very large uh, outbreak of uh, bird flu or avian influenza in the poultry industry. Uh, there was a lot of work done trying to determine what role wild birds played. The virus is believed to have come over from uh, Southeast Asia and was first found in the Pacific Northwest. Later last, uh, last spring, it showed up in Minnesota and affected the poultry industry there. A lot of concerns mostly related to biosecurity, um, how this virus can move from one facility to another, oftentimes on clothing, equipment. It can also be airborne. So that's a concern mainly for the agricultural industry. Our wild birds mainly are resistant to it, and, and they also seem to carry these low pathogenic viruses, which are just like the equivalent of a seasonal flu in humans. So, so just like we have the flu, birds have the flu. And so it's not unusual, of course, to find flu viruses in birds. Um, but uh, what's going on in Southeast Asia is now we have this evolution of the flu virus um, because of the close interconnectedness, um, especially some of these markets in China where there's a lot of birds and waterfowl commingling. So these viruses are able to mutate and transfer back to waterfowl. And so, yes, so there's, there's this incursion of these new viruses, which hopefully uh, have so far we haven't found them to persist in wild bird populations. So that's a good thing. Our wild bird Birds are generally healthy, and they do tend to carry these low pathogenic viruses um, as opposed to these high pathogenic viruses that uh, do cause die-offs in poultry. If you're hiking down a trail or riding your bike down the street and you look out at the woods and say, the world is great, but if you're a scientist like you, is there an inclination to say, oh, man, we're doomed? <laughs> I think there's a great inclination, and I think as scientists we really need to, to stay away from that, and conservationists, because there's always hope. I was reading an article recently, and, and that's exactly what it talked about. As conservationists, we see all the, you know, the negative things happening in the world, the decline in species, so many endangered and threatened species, and all this, you know, disease emergence. But we need to stay positive. There's also a lot of feel-good stories, species that are being brought back from the brink of extinction, and there's still a lot of great wildlife wilderness out there. Nonetheless, as a wildlife veterinarian, there are diseases out there. We'll talk about some specific ones with salamanders and uh, maybe white nose with bats and uh, tick-borne diseases. But let's just say you go out into the backyard. This could affect anybody. You don't have to be a sportsman, a sportswoman. You go out in the backyard, and if you were a mother, you would say, oh, no, put on shoes, you'll step on a bee. Get out of those weeds, you'll get poison ivy, poison oak, sumac, might get a snake bite. There's all these plethora of diseases out there and illnesses and bites and stings that can happen to anybody, especially kids. Mm -hmm. uh, can we talk about any of those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, I would say that, you know, I, I would definitely encourage everyone to go out and enjoy the outdoors and, 
and I wouldn't let any of those things deter me from enjoying the outdoors. Oftentimes, the media sensationalize the concerns, and there's simple things you can do to try to avoid disease exposure or, or poison ivy exposure, whatever it is that you're concerned about. But generally, the benefits far outweigh any negative repercussions of being out there. So to avoid a bee sting, I guess put on shoes, although a bee could strike you anywhere. I remember when sure. I was a little boy and I'd play in the backyard and we had clover out there. Mm-hmm. And the bees would be on the clover and buddy, I about every three weeks or so, I was stepping on a bee oh. and I would scream bloody murder. It happens. It seemed like baking soda really saved the day very often. We are talking this hour with wildlife veterinarian for the state of Kentucky, Dr. Ega Stasiak. More after the break, you are listening to Kentucky Afield Radio. We are back on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin, and the Kentucky State Wildlife Veterinarian is in the studio with me this hour. Her name is Dr. Iga Stasiak. And one thing that I guess should go without saying, doctor, is don't approach wildlife. Squirrels, rabbits, whatever it is, not a good idea. You know, when you're out there, if you see any animals that are diseased or, or sick or, or dead, um, just don't approach them. Uh, it's generally best to avoid them. We have some species here in Kentucky, skunks and bats predominantly, that carry rabies. And there are other diseases you can potentially contract from wildlife. If you see an animal that's sick, best leave it alone. Contact the Wildlife Management Agency. That's taking some, some good steps and keeping your pets vaccinated. Some simple things you can do to avoid exposure um, to some of these common viruses and, and infections that we see. I was talking to a fellow a friend of mine who's in the Boy Scouts. I said, what do you tell your troop? And he said, one thing, don't approach any wildlife at all, and make sure you keep food out of your tent. And if you're camping, and my wife and I were camping last weekend, and I didn't have food in the tent, but I left mm-hmm. some outside. He said, these animals can come in while they may not bother you directly. They may leave disease germs behind. True? Yes, absolutely. But I think more of the concern is is animals becoming habituated to humans. And so that's a really good point about leaving the food out. We actually get quite a few calls. I get a lot of calls uh, from members of the public regarding nuisance wildlife, whether it's an opossum or a raccoon on the porch. And oftentimes they're leaving food out for their cats or other animals. Of course, wildlife are going to come into the area and they might become a nuisance and they might become habituated. And when provoked, uh, they may bite. And so it's best to avoid those sorts of confrontations and just let wildlife be and don't try to encourage them to to come near you try to avoid those altercations the suspicion was that it was raccoons that got into that bag of potato chips on the picnic table Mm -hmm. but i believe it was rabbits just making it look like raccoons it could be (laughs) it's possible although more likely raccoons one thing that we see in raccoons particularly in the springtime we do get a lot of calls about this is canine distemper virus so often we'll get calls about raccoons that are weeping from their eyes they have discharge very debilitated often lethargic these raccoons succumb to an infection called canine distemper which is quite common it's not a disease that's transmissible to humans, but the signs can resemble rabies, which is why people are very concerned about it. It typically affects juvenile raccoons in the springtime and typically runs its course, so we do see this mortality. There's no treatment for it, but you can vaccinate your dogs for it, so dogs are susceptible to it. Most dogs would be vaccinated for the virus, so so if we do see raccoons, it's typically not rabies. It typically is canine distemper, but we still advise people to avoid touching them and, and coming up to them because their behavior is altered by this particular infection, they can be approachable. They can seem quite friendly. Mm-hmm. And that's just the disease running its course. It's, they're not actually uh, as friendly as they look. One thing I come across every now and then is a wasp's nest that I don't really want where the wasp has built his nest. I want the wasp to build a nest, just not in my patio. So I was told once upon a time by an entomologist, if you want to get rid of a, a wasp nest or hornet's nest, insects are cold-blooded. So do it when it's cool, and there's less likely a chance of you getting attacked. Have you heard such a thing, or is that true? I have not heard that. Would it stand to reason? 
sounds reasonable. Other things you can do to avoid diseases in the wild. Let's say you're drinking creek water. Good or bad? Generally bad. A lot of our creeks are contaminated with what we call fecal coliform bacteria, which are bacteria found in fecal excrements. Um, a lot of that is from uh, agricultural runoff, hmm. so livestock production. And a lot of studies have shown very high levels of these bacteria in, in waters. Um, and so I would definitely use a filter if you're going backcountry camping or backpacking. You know, make sure you filter the water. I, I wouldn't drink water from a stream um, because of this potential contamination. I've heard in Kentucky don't eat the wild strawberries. Just because a bird can eat it and do well doesn't mean that we can ingest it. True? Yeah, well I know, uh, you know, just from from uh, my experience uh, working in veterinary practice, there's certain plants that are toxic to certain species. And so they may be toxic to humans and not toxic to dogs or toxic to dogs and, and not toxic to cats. And, and so, um, so yeah, so there's, there's a lot. You have to really look at, at every particular. If you're not familiar with the plant, uh, best look it up. I remember back in the fifth grade, my buddy Kevin Hill and I, he had a farm and he had a hay field. For whatever reason, we got traipsing through this hay field and I came home just an itching mess. I can't remember all the home remedies my mother tried to get my itching to go down, but eventually did. But I guess that happens to a lot of people. They're outside having a good time. Next thing you know, they've got a rash. Is it poison ivy or is this more common than you think? It seems like there's a portion of the population that does react to poison ivy in these types of plants, you know, and then there's a portion of the population that has no sensitivity to it. And I'm one of those people, so so I generally uh, am not very cognizant of, so you're lucky. of that when I when I'm out uh, hiking. I I seem to ignore it, and and I've made out pretty well. Um, but others might might want to look up, see what the, those plants look like, and and try to avoid them. Mosquito bites. Can they give us? We know Zika, but generally speaking in Kentucky, if you get a mosquito bite, my wife got like five the other day, any danger in that we should be aware of? Yes, so there are um, viruses um, particularly that are spread by mosquitoes, um, including, as you mentioned, Zika virus, um, but there are others as well as West Nile virus. If you recall, in the late 90s, was first detected in New York yeah. and has since spread across the United States. It's, it's uh, present across the country. And, is and it that still is, out there? Because it's not oh, in the yeah. news like it once was. It's not, but it's definitely still out there. Most human cases are asymptomatic, just as with Zika virus. Um, most people don't even know they're infected. They may experience mild flu symptoms, and a very small portion of the population has complications associated with it um, where they have encephalitis or brain infection, but that is extremely rare. And so it's possible you may have contracted West Nile virus without knowing it. But because of these complications, it's important to take precautions against mosquitoes, wearing mosquito repellent, long sleeves, long shirt, you know, making sure that you're also uh, removing any standing water around your house. DEET is a good thing, right? It is. So any repellent approved by the Environmental Protection Agency, and there's a long list, uh, and that includes DEET. There's also a lot of natural products like citronella that are quite safe and seem to be quite effective as well. One of the biggest mosquito-borne diseases that I remember is malaria. Is that limited to, say, the Congo or Africa? Do we have that here? No, but it is found in certain... So in Hawaii, for instance, so more tropical, so as you mentioned, more tropical regions. um, But in Hawaii, it's actually quite prevalent uh, and is actually causing significant die-offs of wild birds, Mm. uh, certain species of ducks. Um, The problem is um, a lot of those... You know, especially island ecosystem species haven't been exposed to these pathogens in the past. So you introduce a new uh, new pathogen, and it's, it wipes out the population. And so they've had some um, local extirpation of species linked to malaria. So so it's not something we worry about here in Kentucky, um, but but we it is a concern in other parts of the world. Okay, doctor, let's talk a minute about snake bites. Just because you're bitten by a snake, does that mean? anything at all? It does, particularly reptiles, lizards, and snakes. They have a lot of bacteria in their saliva. It's not 
deadly. You don't need to rush to the hospital, but you do need to seek medical attention in some cases because it can become infected. Reptile bites um, have more likelihood to become infected than other bites. So in most cases, you can watch to make sure that there's no infection and swelling. So watch for things like redness, um, swelling, and heat from that spot. If there's any signs of infection, go see a doctor. Um, uh, If you had... Bactine or first aid cream of whatever description or iodine. Is that kind of what you need maybe to keep with you in a first aid kit when you're outdoors and any of these happen? Yes, yes. That would be uh, my recommendation as well. So so any of these disinfectants, hydrogen peroxide, iodine, alcohol, uh, great to keep with you when you're out in the field, and, and that'll prevent infections. Talking about mosquito bites a minute ago, I should have asked, what do you do after you're bitten? And I heard this old wives' tale, paint the bite with fingernail polish. What would that do? I heard that uh, for chigger bites, but apparently it's a myth. So before I moved to Kentucky, I, I was not familiar with chiggers, and oh my gosh, they are terrible, <laughs> terrible. They just itch for weeks. Uh, and so, yes, there's some old wives tales out there about putting nail polish on and how it's supposed to uh, plug up the chigger and kill it, but that doesn't work, unfortunately. So you just, you have to, you know, maybe maybe use some anti-inflammatories, hydrocortisone cream works fairly well, but, but no, the nail polish is just a, an old wives tale. I remember my grandmother, oh, don't pick up that frog, you'll get a wart. Can frogs and toads give you warts? <laughs> no. No, that is an old wives' tale as well. It's not true. Some of them do secrete toxins in their skin that can cause some irritation. So certain toads, they'll, they'll release toxins, and that can be irritating to your skin, but, but it shouldn't cause warts. If you kiss a frog, will it turn into a prince? I wish, but, but no. It's, it's... <laughs> Wildlife veterinarian Dr. Egastin. Stasiak is here with me, and she will stay for the next half hour. Plus, our fishing report, too, is standing by. Don't go away. My name is Charlie Baglin. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Back into our second half hour. If you would like to hear this show again, it's pretty easily done. You can share it on Facebook or email the link. You can find us on Facebook. Just go to the search box, put in Kentucky Field Radio. There you will like us, and you will find our weekly links. Find them on YouTube as well. Also on iTunes, we are a podcast. Just search for Kentucky Field Radio, and there you are. More with our state wildlife veterinarian coming up. It is time now, though, for our fishing report. <laughs> Jeff Crosby with the Central Fisheries District Fishing Report. Water temperatures are running in the lower 80s. Largemouth bass fishing at many of uh, the Central District lakes is very good. Caught on crate baits and swim jigs when fished on main lake points. Additionally, fishing jigs or creature baits along shoreline with cover is also producing a few fish. Crappie are still being caught at many area lakes such as Taylorsville and Harrington Lakes. Crappie are being caught a lot of minnows, crappie jigs, or small crappie crankbaits when fished in around 6 to 12 feet of water. And finally, don't forget about your local area streams such as Elkhorn Creek and Floyd's Fork for good catches of smallmouth bass and rock bass. Remember always to ask permission before entering private property. Hi, this is Kevin Fry with your Eastern Area Fisheries Report. Stream fishing reports have continued to be good with most stream flows being slightly low. Smallmouth bass have been aggressive hitting small crankbaits and crayfish colors, plastic crawls and tubes, and spinnerbaits. Some walleye also mixed in the catches from Russell Fork and Ratliff Hole, Carson Island, in the confluence area of Elkhorn Creek. Recent largemouth bass fishing has been good for keeper fish on crankbaits and area lakes. Anglers at Dewey and Yatesville Lakes catching multiple keeper fish on each outing. Also, these fishermen catching some white bass in shallow water areas of coves on Dewey Lake. Catfishing continues good in area lakes and streams. Jug fishing with cut bait producing well at Dewey and Fish Trap Lakes for channel and blue catfish. Hi, this is Eric Cummins with your Southwest Kentucky Fishing Report. Barren River Lake, the crappie action has been picking up with some decent sized keeper fish with live bait near brush and structure in about 15 to 16 foot of water. Catfish action is still good on jugs out in the channel and near drop-offs. 
Green River, smallmouth, and rock bass good on crankbaits, soft plastics, and top waters. Also, this is an excellent time of year for some good weight fishing action for bass and sunfish on smaller creeks and rivers using small crankbaits and spinners, Drake's Creek and the forks of it, Gasper River, Little Barren River, Russell Creek, and Long Creek are all good options for that kind of action. As always, good luck and good fishing, and be sure your life jacket's got your back. Tips a hip word, hip hop music. This cat is really hip, says 70 star Sammy Davis Jr. But for migratory bird hunters, hip is the law. HIP stands for Harvest Information Program. To hunt birds like doves or geese, you must complete the HIP survey first to help officials better estimate game bird populations. Go to the My Profile page at the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife website. You just need five minutes. HIP HIP hooray. FW.KY.gov. Uncle Chuck, what is fall? Fall means football, but excitement doesn't end there. This is when Kentucky's outdoors are just getting started. The Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife reminds you, lakes and streams are alive with fall fishing. And for many, the biggest game of the season is white-tailed deer. Get your fishing and hunting license and get your game plan together. This fall, take aim on a winning season at fw.ky.gov. We are back into our second half hour on Kentucky Field Radio. My name is Charlie Baglin. I'm glad you're here. She's one of the good guys in wildlife. Can I say that? Dr. Egastasiak, the state wildlife veterinarian. Now, it's kind of hard to make salamanders exciting, little squirmy little things. They make most people jump when they see them. But they're not to just be written off, especially when you hear what they eat that makes this world a whole lot more livable place for you and me. And, Doctor, if I were a salamander, I would gather all my little salamander buddies and we would stand and salute you. Can you see that? No, they would run away. Oh, no, you're on on the side of salamanders. I'm on the side of salamanders. I'm used to animals running away from me. So we're having worked in a zoo setting and here at the Salado Wildlife Center. Usually when they see the veterinarian, they know, you know, some treatment is coming or they're going to get, you know, swab down their throat and things like that. So uh, the salamanders, they don't know this, though. They are your friend. There's a disease out there affecting salamanders. What is it that we are got our eye to the future hoping doesn't happen here? Sure. Um, so there is a new emerging disease affecting salamanders, and it's called the salamander chytrid fungus. Chytrid fungus. Uh, chytrid fungus. Some of the listeners may be familiar with chytrid fungus. So several decades ago, there was another related chytrid fungus that was discovered, and since then, it's been shown to have caused mass extinctions of amphibians worldwide. We've lost over 200 species of amphibians as a result of this fungus, mainly in tropical regions, but even so here in uh, in North America. Um, Well, there is a new emerging chytrid fungus that was discovered in Europe. It was first reported in 2013, and what they found was extensive die-offs of fire salamanders in the Netherlands. So they had more than 90% mortality, and they identified a new fungus which invades the skin, causing erosions ulcerations and eventually kills off the salamanders believed to have been introduced through the exotic pet trade. These are like pet trade you could go to any big store or the pet aisle and buy? Absolutely. So that we actually get um, hundreds of thousands of amphibians imported from Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. I believe 99% of salamanders imported into the U.S. are actually from Southeast Asia, where this fungus is believed to have originated. And the, it doesn't seem to affect the species in Southeast Asia, similar to other fungi we know, like white nose syndrome, which is impacting bats, also present in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, Fortunately, our species here in North America are susceptible to it. Thankfully, the fungus is not yet here. But we do have a very active exotic pet trade, and there's a lot of concerns about releasing, you know, if you have pet salamanders, releasing them into the wild or moving animals around. And we're really worried about the salamander coming in um, because it's been shown to impact um, some of our common species, species that we have here in Kentucky. Couldn't you say the same thing about tropical fish? If you had an aquarium, went to the fish store and bought some lovely fish, colorful, and then eventually turned them loose in the local creek, 
could that cause maybe the same problems? It could, yes, and and it has in the past. So, you know, invasive pathogens come with these species that are being imported, and, and they can cause significant die-offs, and the species themselves can become established, like the Asian carp. Uh, we've got species that, that are introduced and established themselves and then start out-competing our native mm-hmm. organisms. So in this case, we're talking about invasive fungus that could establish itself and affect our, our salamander populations, which are really important to our our native ecosystems and have some important roles that they play. 100,000 pet stores out there would say, oh no, it's not us. Don't blame us. Can you even thwart the pet trade at all? It's challenging. Um, The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, in light of this fungus, has issued a moratorium on importation of certain species of salamanders actually from Southeast Asia as a result of this. And so they are trying to ban the import of species that are known carriers of the fungus in the hopes of preventing this introduction. And so so there's still a lot of legal exotic pet trade that goes on, and there's likely some illegal pet trade as well. Um, I wouldn't, you know, go as far as to blaming the, the, the pet trade industry. I think, um, you know, we're lacking in some precautions that we have for agriculture and livestock and things like corn and testing before bringing animals in. We don't really have that for exotic pets. So they come in, they're not really subject to the same rigorous testing to make sure that they're disease-free before they come into the country. But, you know, certainly salamanders um, here in Kentucky, we've got 35 species of salamanders. The Appalachian region has the greatest salamander diversity in the world. It's not something you can walk out your back door and see readily, but they're there. Where will you find a salamander? Well, salamanders are found in all kinds of habitats, and that's why we have so many species here in Kentucky. So we've got, I believe, 10 terrestrial species and 20 that have aquatic larvae. So they're both terrestrial and aquatic. They're found in all kinds of wetlands, ponds, marshes, lakes, even in some streams. Under Um, wet leaves. Yeah, they like to stay moist. um, So they're terrestrial species often found on the forest floor. Uh, They like to hide in, in moist areas. Is a salamander a lizard? Salamanders are amphibians, so they are not reptiles. Okay. So, so lizards are lizards typically reserved for reptiles, but uh, salamanders are actually amphibians. Somebody's going to say, Doctor Stasiak, get a grip. Yeah. It's just a salamander. <laughs> we don't need them. What is the role of a salamander in the world around us? Sure, um, salamanders play a really important role in our ecosystems. They consume vast amounts of insects, so beetles, ants, various crustaceans, and arthropods. Um, so they they are actually a natural form of pest control for us. Um, so they do provide a service free of charge. So they're predators. They're important predators. They're also prey for other species. Turtles, aquatic turtles, snakes, birds, small mammals also feed on salamanders. So they're an important part of the food web. You know, we talk about greenhouse gas emissions and carbon dioxide. There's decomposers, insects on the forest floor that decompose leaf litter uh, and dirt. Um, so salamanders eat those critters. They eat those insects. And so they slow that process, slow the release of carbon into the atmosphere and keep all those nutrients down on the soil. There's a plethora of benefits that yeah. many of which we don't even understand or, or don't really haven't discovered yet. There's not enough money to pay a salamander for what they do for us. If we had to go out and do this ourselves, I guess we couldn't do it. No, we, we probably couldn't. And the same has been shown with bats and uh, the recent white nose syndrome fungus. And there's been studies where they've shown that bats benefit us tremendously and, and save the agricultural industry billions of dollars in, in natural pest control services. So, so no, I don't, I don't think that uh, they could be replaced. The fear is that this disease, this chytrid fungus, could, if it isn't already, come to the United States. So we're actually part of the initiative here in Kentucky, and we're just finishing up our first year of, of a large amphibian disease study. Part of that is trying to figure out if salamander chytrid is here. Um, So we are sampling salamanders across the state, and this is a nationwide initiative as well. Thankfully, uh, just having finished this first year of the study, we have not yet detected salamander chytrid in Kentucky, um, and, and it has not yet been detected in the U.S., so we're hoping that trend continues. The pet trade 
Back in 2015, I was reading an article from the United States Geological Survey, and I'm sure you've seen this. Let me read from it. In the pet trade, over 28 million amphibians were reported in the United States over a six-year period during the last decade, and that importation rate has not declined. So the pet trade is strong. Thus, there's a serious concern that the disease may be introduced in the U.S. in the near future if it's not already here. In this part I've underlined. This is particularly alarming because the eastern U.S. is home, like you said, to the highest diversity of salamanders in the world. So Kentucky's position in all of this, are we more or less affected? Are there states out there more prone to get this or maybe to see it first? The Appalachian region is probably the most susceptible to the introduction of this fungus and its impacts because we have such a diversity of salamander species, because we have suitable conditions, and uh, we're really close to these ports of entry um, where these exotic salamanders and other species are coming in as well. There have been studies that have looked at various regions that are susceptible, the West Coast as well, and, and parts of Mexico, but here in the U.S., the Appalachian region is probably number one as far as our concerns regarding this fungus. I'm just the type, if I was sitting on a step and saw a salamander on the sidewalk, I'd ask him how he felt (laughs) and hope that he feels happy and well because I want him to be... Yeah. I want him to be a happy little salamander and do his work. Yeah, I I would hope the same. And um, we do have concerns, but it's important to realize that we do have healthy, uh, robust populations of amphibians here in Kentucky right now. And we're hoping that they stay that way. So, you know, we're seeing these declines across parts of the U.S. and and globally. And we're just hoping that uh, we can mitigate some of these impacts and protect our salamanders and our amphibian species. We're talking specifically about salamanders, but they are an amphibian, would this affect frogs? No, not the same fungus. So the salamander chytrid fungus only affects salamanders. There's a related fungus called BD or Batrachochytrium dendrobatidus. Do it again. BD stands for? Batrachochytrium dendrobatidus. Do it again. Batrachochytrium dendrobatidus. That's amazing. I saw that word doing my research. I had no clue how to pronounce it. Yeah, it's, it's challenging. BD. BD. So BD for short. So BD fungus is the one that has caused global amphibian declines, and that is the one that affects frogs and toads. So this other fungus, the BD chytrid, um, has been very, very detrimental, and, and, and that is part of our initiative here in Kentucky. We've, like I said, finished our first year of a study, and we're also trying to understand the distribution of this BD chytrid here in Kentucky to see if it has any impacts on our populations. Um, it is widespread globally. We don't know if there's certain wetlands that carry it. Uh, where amphibians carry it and others where they don't, um, and whether or not it is responsible for any die-offs here locally. So we're trying to get at that information, and we're looking at trying to correlate that with the habitat characteristics and the quality of the habitats to try to see if if certain types of habitats are more likely to harbor uh, this fungus. The work of Kentucky's wildlife veterinarian is our topic this hour. Still to come, an update on the hunt, not for deer, but for a serious disease affecting deer. Plus, TikTok. What is the time frame to avoid infection from a tick bite? We'll have the answer in our final few. Stay with us. You're listening to Kentucky Field Radio. Back on Kentucky Field Radio, my name is Charlie Baglin. We're in our final few minutes with Doc Stasiak, wildlife veterinarian. The count, according to several scientific sources, and I'm grabbing these numbers from the BBC, this is worldwide, the natural world contains about 8.7 million species. I didn't see it described as such, but my bet is the vast majority of this 8.7 million is insects. More are found every day, but the vast majority have not been identified. And cataloging all of these so that we know what they look like and have a description of these creatures would take more than a thousand years. And with the way that we're blistering the earth with our towns and factories and roads and everything else, many will go extinct before we ever get a chance to get them named. Of that 8,700,000, nearly 900 are ticks. The ticks are well-known blood-sucking little bugs. They pester humans. They bite livestock, pets, 
They are also vectors of a wide variety of diseases that can infect animals, and they're listed second only to mosquito bites in terms of public health importance. Tick bites. Doctor, what does that mean for us here in Kentucky for people who love the outdoors? Um, Generally, it's not good um, because certain ticks do carry disease. And so uh, here in Kentucky, we have ticks that carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever. We have ticks that carry Lyme disease, which is an emerging disease. So traditionally in Kentucky, we haven't had uh, too many of the black-legged ticks that carry Lyme disease. In recent years, we've had more, and we've seen more cases of Lyme disease as well. And so, yes, you should definitely uh, be aware and check yourself for ticks. Um, The good news is most of the ticks do need to stay on for at least 24 hours to transmit infection. So if you check yourself after you come home and and take the ticks off, it should not be an issue. How do you take the tick off? Tweezers are pretty good. I usually just use my fingernails. So you want to grab it right at the base, so just around the the head, uh, the mouth parts, and then just pull it out. It's not extremely complicated. You don't want to leave the head in there to prevent infection. But usually if you grasp them right near your skin, you should be able to pull them out. I saw a map plotting where tick-borne diseases were occurring. If you look up in the northeast in New England around Lyme, Connecticut, where the disease took its name, you'll find a lot of, say, green dots. And if you look at Kentucky, you'll find more Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain spotted fever. In in this one map, I only saw just a few dots. But, buddy, you just go right down into Tennessee, and it is loaded. Have you seen that map? I have seen the map. We still haven't had very many cases of Lyme disease in Kentucky. And most of the surveillance has been based on human submissions to the public health department. So, you know, someone finds a tick on themselves, they'll send it in for testing. So what we've done is we're doing surveys. This past year, we started surveying wildlife, so including deer, elk, bear, various species for ticks across the state. Because these ticks, they feed on humans, and they also feed on animals as well. That's actually helped us with our understanding of the distribution of these tick vectors across the state. So I think we'll be able to fill that map in within the next few years as we you know, move forward and do our surveys, and um, we'll be able to, to fill in those gaps. I think there's, there's more of the black-legged ticks than previously believed. Have you done enough surveys yet to really know the, how dispersed ticks are in this day? We've done enough, or we have enough preliminary data to get an idea of the distribution, but not the abundance. So um, I, I think, you know, generally wooded areas or where there's long brush, you're more likely to find ticks. So going out there, everyone should take proper precautions and, and wear mosquito or tick repellent, long sleeves, long pants. One thing you do is related to the deer population, still checking for chronic wasting disease, sort of a mad cow disease that occurs in deer. Has it been found in Kentucky? No, thankfully it has not yet been found in Kentucky. However, it has been found in most of our surrounding states, except for Indiana and Tennessee. Um, So it is a disease we're monitoring for very closely, and every year we test over a 1,000 deer and elk across the state to try to detect this disease early if it is present. And we're hoping that Kentucky will stay free of this disease, which does cause wasting and, and loss of condition in deer and elk. And it's a significant concern for us. So we're thankful right now that uh, that we haven't found it yet, but we're being very vigilant. I've always thought that the instant you start talking about it and describe the symptoms, well, if you see a deer behaving this way or at this time of day, then instantly the power of suggestion is going to say, oh, well, I saw that last week. Oh, we must have it, which isn't the case according to scientific testing. Right. And I'm hoping that you don't ever find it, but if you do, what then? Well, we just finished revising our chronic wasting disease response plan. So we do have a plan in place for what we're going to do if we do find CWD here. And that is going to include, uh, involve a large surveillance zone. We're going to try to see if it's established on the w- landscape, how widespread it is. And we're going to try to test as many animals as possible from that area to get an idea and then try to control the spread as best we can. You know, when we get to that stage, we'll be working with hunters to try to 
take deer out from the area that's infected to try to limit the spread to other deer across the state. This disease is persistent in the environment. You couldn't just take every infected deer, harvest that deer, and wipe out the disease. It's still here, right? Right. And that's the the scary part about this disease is because once it's established on the landscape, it's nearly impossible to eradicate or eliminate. So what we're trying to do is prevent its introduction. And we're doing that through regulations. Um, So currently you cannot import high-risk carcass parts from CWD-positive states. Uh, So certain tissues such as the brain and spinal cord that are more likely to have infection, we're not allowing those to be imported into the state uh, to try to protect our herd. So there's some preventative measures that we can take. This sounds like a a 40-hour-a-day job. It, it and all that you do, doctor, it sounds like there's not enough time to take care of ticks and salamanders and white nose syndrome and bats and problems we have, might have, could have with deer. How do you get it done? Well, I think, you know, that's what keeps the job exciting. So the variety uh, is what keeps it interesting and challenging. You seem um, optimistic, though, in every case. I, I like to be. I think I have to be. I think you have to be optimistic uh, in this line of work and hope that uh, we are going to be able to preserve and conserve our wildlife populations and that uh, eventually we'll get a handle on some of these diseases. And, and, and most importantly, that, you know, people, humans and, and wildlife can coexist and that um, you know, future generations can really enjoy the wildlife just as we do and for many generations to come. Glad we have you on our side. So thanks for coming by today. Thank you very much, Charlie. It's been a good show. We're out of time. This is Charlie Bagman inviting you to join us in a week and we'll go inside outdoors again here on Kentucky Field Radio. 